Praise the Lord. Hey, welcome everybody to Open Arms Community Church and to part one of a new series that uh, we're kicking off today called Storms. And we're going to be talking about finding God in the storms. You know, um, storms, uh, as is true in nature, is also true in life in general. And you'll notice this is in your outlines, and that is that storms, both literally and figuratively, are a part of our world. And, uh, you know, the fact is, is that we've all gone through them. We've seen the rain clouds in the sky, and we've seen the, the wind blowing and trees knocked over and lightning striking in nature, and we have felt those same kinds of elements rip-roaring through our lives, whether it's been through sickness and disease or addictions or, or maybe uh, relationship turbulence or financial struggles. We've all found ourselves in places where uh, it just feels like life is one big storm, and we're trying to make sense of it. We're trying to, to figure it out, you know, and we're trying to also figure out where's this coming from, and, and where's God in this storm, and, and if he loves me, why is he letting me go through this? Why is this happening, and, uh, you know, why won't he help me? And I've been through storms in my own life. As I mentioned while we were worshiping, I didn't grow up a Christian. I actually, uh, you know, was born into a, a pretty messed up home, uh, abusive on the front end. Um, we watched uh, all kinds of acts of violence take place, you know, drug and alcohol abuse. And, uh, and, and I've been a child that went through divorce. I've seen the massive effects of adultery. We, my wife and I have lost a child. We've been through financial distress. We've battled habits and addictions. I mean, there have been just all kinds of storms. My one son was maimed. We, uh, as I mentioned, we lost a daughter. We've lost friends. I mean, none of these things are easy to go through. None of them are fun. And all of them can evoke fear. All of them can cause us to feel like we're out of control and, and we're in this tailspin that we don't know if we're going to be able to get out of. And here's the thing. When we start asking the question of where's God and why is this happening, the first thing that I want us to understand today about these storms, and it's in your outlines, is that some are from God, some are from the devil, and some are environmental. Some are circumstantial, and some are of our own choices. So out of that list of about five to six different sources of storms in our life, God is only one of those factors. And I've given you some scriptural references for you to go back and look for yourself and see examples of each of those. But here's the, the, the reality, is that storms will come. It's not a question of, of if they'll happen in our life. It's really just a question of when. And when they come, they come in varying degrees. Some of them are very big and loud and turbulent and, and knock things down and destroy things, and others, less so. Maybe we just have to weather it a little bit. Maybe a few shingles get blown off of our house or something like that. But the fact is, is that they're not all exactly the same. But all of them, all of them have to be endured. All of them we have to persevere through. And the fact is, is that no matter who you are today and no matter how big and dark your storm is or how easy, whether it's small or large, the fact is, is you're not the only one that goes through storms. A lot of times we get really bogged down in our circumstances and we feel like, man, we're just really going through it and, and everybody else has it easier. And the fact is, is nobody is exempt from storms of life. Everybody goes through them. And what is hard to you might be easy to them. What's hard to them might be easy for you because we're all different. And so don't minimize the storms that other people are going through because the reality is it's a storm to them, right? It's a storm to them. So here's the deal. Even Jesus, is clo Jesus himself, God in the flesh, went through storms of life and his closest followers. And we're actually in this series going to take 
uh, four weeks to look at four different storms that are recorded in the Bible and where God was in those storms. What was the cause of the storm? Was it God? Was it something else? And we're also going to recognize what God was doing in the midst of the storm because what you're going to find is that um, a lot of times the storms that come, God doesn't always push them away. While God isn't the cause, there are times where he will allow us to go through storms. And we need to understand why. So, <clears throat> if you're a, a, a person that has been in the Bible at all, you will remember that in Matthew chapter 5, we have Jesus climbing up on top of this mountain. And he climbs up onto this mountain and uh, kind of a, a really big hill, if you will, <clears throat> And he starts to talk to this massive crowd of thousands of people that have assembled to hear him talk. And starting in Matthew chapter 5, we have Jesus starting a message, a sermon, a speech, how, whatever way you want to classify it. And it is the longest recorded speech of Jesus in the entire Bible. And so we have, starting in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, all the way through to Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, we have Jesus giving this long speech where he gives some very profound truths and some hard-hitting uh, directions and how we're supposed to live our life. It's not necessarily what we want to hear, but it is what we need to hear if we're going to bring our life in alignment with what is best, okay? Okay. But here's the thing, <clears throat> after Jesus gets done talking on the side of this mountain for three chapters, in, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, he comes walking down the side of the mountain through the crowd, and the next thing you know, people start coming to him with all of their needs. So he's already spent a good bit of time talking to them about the kingdom of God, and now they're coming to him, and now Jesus begins to demonstrate the kingdom of God. He heals a centurion servant. He heals a leper, and a leper was a diseased person that was a social outcast. And by the way, to heal that centurion servant was a big deal because a Roman centurion was considered the enemy to the Jewish nation. So this was Jesus blessing and serving those that were not only social outcasts, but outright enemies of the state. And he's helping them. He's blessing them and serving them. He also healed Peter's mother-in-law uh, and many crowds, crowds of sick people and even the demon-possessed. He, he cast demons out of people. So then, after he does this, he tells, he, it says in, in Matthew chapter 8, that he gave his disciples orders to get in the boat and cross over to the other side. And in the process, as he's getting ready to get in the boat, these other people come to Jesus and they say, you know, teacher, teacher, I want to come follow you. And Jesus said to them, foxes have holes, right? And birds have nests or foxes have dens, birds have nests. And he says, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So in other words, if you want to come follow me, you got you to put this world in, in second or third place. To follow me means that there's going to be a cost. And then another guy comes to him and he says, Lord, let me come and follow you, but I just need to go bury my father first. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead, Right? In other words, he's saying there is no relationship on planet Earth that should take number one place in your life over your relationship with Jesus and to recognize that the earthly activities that we engage in are temporal. We are consumed with the superficial and the melodrama of a very temporary world. And we prioritize things in ways that are based on a superficial standard. In the end, it will not matter. So much of our time, so much of our energy, so much of our anxiety is birthed out of these temporary concerns. And Jesus is saying, get your perspective in order. Recognize the priority here. So then, 
he goes to get in the boat. And I want to not look at the Matthew version of this story. I want to look at Mark's version. In Mark chapter 4, and we'll pick up in your outlines there, it says in verse 35 that the day, uh, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. And I want you to circle that phrase, go over to the other side. And as I mentioned, he had already, it is recorded in Matthew's gospel, gave orders, it says, literally, to his disciples to get in the boat to go to the other side. So the first question, before we go any far farther, is do you think that Jesus meant what he said right here? So when you read that, Jesus said to them, let us go over to the other side. Do you hear a directive? Or do you hear, do you hear a command? Or do you hear a promise? See, in the Christian faith, this is the beauty. And this is where most of us struggle. Is that we, we need a paradigm shift. Notice in your outline that this is both a command and a promise. <clears throat> it is a command. It is a directive. God's telling them to go somewhere, to go do something. And what is that something? Go into a boat and go to the other side. So it is a directive. It is a command, to be sure, but it is also a promise. Do you think Jesus meant what he said when he said, go to the other side? Yeah. And what Jesus commands here, he has also promised. He's also telling them what his will is, where he wants them to go, what the outcome should look like. What is the promise that God has spoken to you? What's the directive? What is the command that he's told you to do? Where has he told you to go? What has he told you to do? Friends, if he said go to the other side, do you think he meant it? Yeah. Be sure of this. Our series is called Storms for a Reason. When Jesus gives you the command and he tells you to go do something, be advised it will not be without resistance. It will not be without a storm or a challenge. And so notice in verse 36, he and his disciples, they get in the boat, and leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat, and there were also other boats with him. So notice, what is about to happen isn't isolated to just a few folks. This isn't hidden in obscurity. No, 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 there were people that witnessed what you and I are about to read. Verse 37 says, a furious squall came and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. So circle the word furious because I want you to see this is no small storm. Not only did a storm come, Jesus gave the command, which was also a promise that if you obey that command, you know what his desired outcome is and God is. His arm is not too short or weak. He is, his intelligence does not fall short of whatever your situation is. He knows and he can do and he is faithful to do it. Amen? And so notice here that a furious squall, not a small storm, a major storm comes. And notice too that this is understood to be an act of nature. This isn't a storm that God caused. We, it doesn't even blame the devil here. It is merely an environmental act. Okay? Important to note. Not every storm that you go through, not every crisis and difficulty or challenge is of God's making or the devil's making. Sometimes it is merely circumstances. You and I live in a broken world where all kinds of things are happening 
that God never intended to happen. Babies are born with birth defects. People come under sickness and disease, and this is environmental many times. Sometimes it's environmental in the stuff we're eating, the stuff we're breathing. But nonetheless, we can't blame God or the devil on these. Notice, the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And in Luke chapter 8, as he's describing this story, he says they were in very great danger. So this was a very serious storm. And the boat is now being not only rocked, tossed, and turned, but water's coming in, and it looks like they're going to go down. So verse 38. And by the way, when it says a furious squall, Understand that several of these disciples that are in this boat, they are professional fishermen. They have spent their life on the water. They know what is dangerous water and what is, easy, what is uh, safe water that you can navigate, okay? They know the difference. They fully understood the seriousness of their situation. And note verse 38, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, had a hard day, right? Storms do not mean that God is not with you. Notice, Jesus is there with them. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Circle the phrase, don't you care. How many have ever wondered whether God cared? The storm is hitting, and it's a furious one. And you feel like your ship is sinking. You feel like you're going to drown. In Matthew's story, he records that they cried out, Lord, save us. Have you, have you ever had that as your prayer? Help, right? But we also learned something else. They didn't just say, Lord, save us. They also questioned the heart. They questioned the integrity and the character and the attitude of God toward them. They find themselves in a storm. It was not of their own poor choices. They're not seeing this as an act of God against them. They're not seeing this as an act of the devil. But nonetheless, in this, these circumstances, they are struggling and questioning. Where are you? Don't you care? Aren't you going to do something about this? Aren't you going to help us? Lord, save us. And you know, I put this in your outlines because we are enamored with God's stories working in other people's lives. We love to hear those stories of people experiencing the supernatural and the miraculous, right? And we always want that to be our story. We're like, man, I wish that God would do that in my life. How come I don't get to see it? And in your outlines, I want you to notice that everyone wants the miracle, but no one wants to be in the circumstance that requires a miracle. And honestly, sadly, when we do find ourselves in the circumstances that require a miracle... Instead of being a papal, people of faith, we're like the disciples, freaking out. God, where are you? Don't you care? Save us. Help. Right? We all want the miracle, but none of us want to be in the place that requires one. And when we are in that place so often, instead of drawing near to the Lord, and trusting him and believing, we fall into the same fear and the same freaking out that we see displayed in the disciples right here. Don't you care, right? So verse 39 says that Jesus got up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Circle the word completely. Because when God does intervene, it may be 
fast, it may be slower, but when he works, he works his plan completely. Make no mistake and have no fear. There isn't some aspect of what God wants to achieve and do that's going to be left undone because some storm is going to rob your life of it, okay? Verse 40 goes on to say, He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Underline afraid and underline no faith. Matthew 8 says, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? And what I want us to see here, friends, is that we have, first of all, many of us, like the disciples, made our God very small and made our problems, our storms, very big. And we don't discount, discount at all how furious this squall was. The Bible says it was a bad one. It was huge. And it was going to be devastating and destructive. The professional fishermen who have lived their lives on the water understood how serious the situation was. But no matter how big the storm is, our God is bigger. Our God is bigger, and he is faithful. Amen? I want you to notice in your outlines, though, he said two things to them. He said, why are you afraid? And then he said, do you still have no faith? So fear, friends, fear oftentimes is referred to in other people as no faith or a lack of faith. But I like to say it this way. Fear is faith in reverse. Because to fear is to believe something. It's just not in what God has promised. Fear is where you believe in the power of your problem over the power of God's promise. Fear is where you believe that the size of your problem is bigger than the size of your God. That's what fear is. Fear is that I believe something very strongly. It just isn't that God's going to come through. Right? Fear is faith in reverse. We believe in the circumstance or the people the problem more than we believe God. Verse 41. So before, when the storm is blasting and it looks like they're all going to die, they were afraid. Now, verse 41, Jesus has calmed the storm and it is a tranquil sea. And it says their response is they were terrified. Circle the word terrified. The word there is recorded by Luke as in fear and amazement. And here's why. They asked each other, who is this? Underline that phrase. Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this? Who is Jesus to you? Is he just a good religious teacher? Is he just a, another figure in history? Uh, a man who was a good guy, taught love, but that's it? Or is he who he said he was? Is he God in the flesh, on mission? to lay his life down as a sacrifice to save the world. Who is this that can calm the storms in our life? It should cause us to have fear and awe, right? Amazement or wonder. 
we have to decide, friends, where we're going to put our faith. We're not telling you to trust that, that Mike or, or anyone in this room is your healer or your deliverer or your savior. What we're saying is that it's Jesus and the same God who calmed this storm that was circumstances, if we'll trust them, will calm the storm in our, our lives. And let's be honest, none of us are perfect, and more times than not, we'll probably do more freaking out than faith walking, right? And I want you to see that God is compassionate. I want you to see that Jesus, he did ask them, he did confront them, and Jesus is going to confront you. It wasn't unloving of him to call them out and say, hey, what's wrong with you? Why are you so afraid? Do you still not have faith? Be prepared. Jesus is going to ask you that from time to time. Because there are aspects of our life where things are going well and we feel very good and, and we're walking close with Jesus. And then there are things in our life, there are areas in our life where Jesus is going to come along and say, I'd like to work on this now. And we're going to get all stressed out and anxious and freak out and be like, no, 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 not that one. Yeah, that one. And friends, when you go to obey God, I want you to see that storms do come. Following Jesus and obeying his commands does not make you exempt from the brokenness of this world. I want you to see that. But he is with you, and I want you to know that. And he will be as he was here, the calmer of the storms. But what I'd like you to see in your outlines is it is not a matter of will these storms come, but rather when. And when they come, the question is, will these storms serve the purpose in your life that God allowed them to take place? You see, let's be honest, God knew that furious squall was coming, right? He could have easily just said, no, not today. But he didn't. So, why? And in your outlines, I want you to notice that storms reveal things about God and about us. In this storm... We learn that God is faithful. We learn that God is with us at all times. We learn that he's trustworthy and that when we go to him, he answers and that he is bigger and more powerful than whatever the furious storm is in our life, that he brings peace into the storm, right? And we also see that when he says to do something, we can do it. He said, go to the other side. A lot of people have asked the question, you know, if it was such a bad storm, how come Jesus is sleeping in the boat? Because he knew where he was going. Jesus said, go to the other side. And that's what he fully intended to do. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't concerned. And it wasn't because he couldn't drown. It's because he knew where he had been directed to go and he was going to go there. And no storm, no challenge is going to cause him to be distracted or dissuaded or diverted. He's not going to be afraid and lose heart. When you and I go through these storms in life, it shows us something about God and something about ourselves. So what storms are you going through right now? And what are those storms revealing? What are they revealing about you? Are you as faith-filled as you thought you were? Do you know God like you thought you did? Are you as close to him as you thought you were? Are you going in the right direction? We're going to look at some other storms that happen for different reasons. And we're going to see how God was at work in them. But what are these storms revealing to us about ourselves, 
Are we the kind of person that runs away from God instead of running to him? Do we respond in trust and react, or, or do we react out of emotions? How is it that we react and respond in these? Do we believe or doubt? In your outlines, as we wrap up here today, God is clear that not every storm comes from him. But he wants to use every storm we go through to grow or teach or train us. What is God wanting to teach or train you? What was it that he wanted to teach the disciples? That when he said, go to the other side, he meant it. That when he said to do this, they could do it. Some of us in here, we've had God's command. We've had his directive in our life. And the reason that we've not done it is because, not because we don't believe God can, but because we don't believe we can. We know he told us to do it, but we don't think we can do it. And here's what you need to know. As we see from the disciples here, on their own, could they beat the storm? No. And on your own, you can't either. But you and Jesus together, you can more than overcome. You can do what he said to do. All of the storms that I've been through have taught me that God is faithful, that he's good, that he's bigger and smarter than anything that I've ever faced. I've seen his goodness. I've seen his faithfulness. I've seen his answer to prayer. I've also seen when I fell short, when I didn't run to him, when I didn't trust. I've also seen the consequences of that and I have seen his faithfulness still overcome all of those shortcomings and failures. Let's close our eyes for a moment. This morning, whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that you're going through, I just want to encourage you right now. We're going to say a prayer. And I want to invite you to just say this prayer, to call out to Jesus. You may feel that you're holding tightly to Christ right now in your storm, or you may feel like you've lost your grip and are getting sucked up in the tornado and are just being thrown all around. But today, Jesus wants to say, peace, be still. Be calm. So if it's in your heart to uh, draw near to him, to experience his touch in your life and whatever it is that you're facing or going through, I just want to invite you to say this prayer with our church family today. Say, Father God, I run to you this morning and I cry out, help. I know you care. I know you're bigger and stronger and smarter and able. And most importantly, I know you're willing. So touch my life. Heal my hurt, calm the storm, take charge, help me to get to the other side. Not for some superficial thing, but so that my life can be aligned with you and lived in a way that honors you that brings eternal life to me and to those around me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.